Russian Revolution sparked a revolution in film editing as well. The crazy uh, Russians started fucking around with images, all right, and juxtaposing them and creating different emotional effects. Lenin saw film as the perfect medium to inspire his largely illiterate nation to join the revolution. They took these films out in the middle of the farmlands and showed it to the farmers and the peasants. They began to understand that they could get a certain emotional, psychological effect by a certain type of cutting from one image to the next. And that became a manipulation of what the audience was feeling. The Russian filmmakers rejected the bourgeois stories and seamless editing practiced by Griffith. Instead of melodrama, they offered real life. To make the film Man with a Movie Camera, documentary filmmaker Ziga Vertov and his team took his cameras into the streets to record a typical day in Moscow. It's constantly reminding me that I'm watching a movie. There are scenes inside an editing room. You see how they edited movies back in 1929. They were engaged in a pure explosion of creative activity in manipulating these images. Every modern editing convention that we know of is demonstrated in Man with the Movie Camera. The film celebrated not just the revolution, but the role of the cameraman and the editor in helping to create it. Vertov and his wife, Elisabetta, cut their documentaries and newsreels in dark basements with rats scuttling underfoot. But in this film, he made the editor as important as any other worker in the revolution. The theoretician Lev Kuleshov also experimented with film editing. In his most famous study, he took a shot of a Russian actor and intercut it with three different objects. A bowl of hot soup, a distraught woman draped across her husband's coffin, and a little girl playing with a teddy bear. When audiences saw the film, they raved about the actor's performance. How hungrily he looked at the soup. How sorrowfully he gazed at the woman. And how tenderly he watched the little girl. But actually, it was the same expression each time. Now, this demonstrates the power of juxtaposition, the power of montage, by taking one shot and another shot to give it a third meaning. And the third meaning is an effect, an emotion, that's much greater than the sum total of the two parts that put it together in the first place. And this is the basis of all editing, by the way. One of Kuleshov's contemporaries, Sergei Eisenstein, combined these experiments with Marxist ideology to create films of revolutionary fervor. He saw editing like history, as a clash of images and ideas. The meaning of the film was not in the shots themselves, but in their collision. When two elements are in conflict, he argued, their collision sparks a new meaning of higher order. Where Griffith tried to hide his cuts, Eisenstein reveled in them. He wanted the audience to feel the frame, to know that this is a movie, not life. Eisenstein is the first real director killed himself in his staging and he killed himself with his camera work and everything but it was all at the service of the scissors every little single thing solitary bit of it i got a movie projector when i was like 11 and one of the first movies i got was battleship potemkin i just ran that odessa step sequence over and over again i couldn't believe what i was seeing one of the things that makes it incredible is the editing the incredible juxtaposition of images what the Russians did was a response to what Griffith had done. Classical editing and now Eisensteinian montage. Then you can take that further. The American cinema has absorbed all of that stuff from the Russians. And now it's in our film.
fact is that many of these techniques have been appropriated into what we do every day as editors, right here in Hollywood, California, making action pictures. Because we are also trying to get a response from the audience. We are also trying to get them to rise out of their seats, rise out of their complacency, but not necessarily for revolutionary purposes, but just to really have a great time in the movie. Editing techniques the Soviets used to convert their population to communism now drive Hollywood's action blockbusters. Where's the shot? What shot? I took out the shot. Which shot is that? The money shot! Bus driver's head, the brains on the window shot, the visor on the visor shot. Davis, we thought we'd show it to you like this, you know, without all the... Put it back! Don't show me anything. You don't need it. You're not even giving it a chance. How's the rear view mirror gag supposed to work without it? Am I the only one here who respects the writing? You've got suspense and you've got action, and 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 I found a good combination in the two Terminator films was to was to have a suspenseful build up to an action release. In Terminator Two, you have a slow, tense build up of these characters moving around, closing in on young John Connor, and then he, he sees the Terminator for the first time, and it's all in slow motion. And I used to like to use the slow motion in the build up where it has this kind of protracted, dreamlike or nightmarish quality. And then there's a cathartic break, and then it kicks into gear. Get down. something is going right or something is going wrong and you want to accentuate that and rhythm is one of the ways you do that you also want to create peaks and valleys in terms of rhythm chases are a wonderful thing to work on as an editor i wouldn't want to do them as a steady diet but every now and then it's great fun my favorite chase that i've ever worked on actually was the canal chase as we called it in terminator 2. <laughs> Our ancestors were survivors, therefore we're here. And so there's something plugged into our reptilian hindbrain that makes us relate to the idea of being pursued and getting away. So we get to go through these kind of cathartic simulator runs when we watch a movie, and we get to experience that, that heart-pounding fear of being chased. It's a natural form of excitement. Editing can hone that, sharpen that, the tempo of the cuts, the variety of shots that are used the changing image sizes of characters, reactions, eyes. All these things are in the palette. By manipulation and juxtaposition, you can increase the excitement. Oh là là, Michel. Tu peux entrer? Oui. In France, a group of film critics turned directors also challenged the doctrine of invisible editing and launched a revolution among editors. When I first saw the film Nouvelle Vague, um, I, I instantly loved it. I loved the idea. I loved the way they edited and thought I would like to, to cut like that. J'aime une fille qui a une très jolie nuque, de très jolis seins, une très jolie voix, de très jolis poignets, un très joli front, de très jolis genoux. You know, Godard used jump cuts because it was like, well, why not? You know, there's nothing interesting happening in this middle part, so let's just go to a jump cut. When I saw Bethes, I was staggered at Goddard's brutality. What they brought to editing was a breaking of the rules. Whatever books that said this is how it had to be done, they burned them. Breathless is too hip for me. I, I, I come from Lower East Side. I'm an Italian-American guy. It was, it's too beat, beatnik. It's like, you know, bohemian. It's too cool. I liked it. I don't know what the hell was happening in it. You know, when I first saw Breathless in the 60s, it's like, wow. I mean, just in the first uh, five-minute sequence in introducing Jean-Paul Belmondo's character as this petty thief, I mean, every rule was violated in terms of how long to hold the shot, uh, uh, the discontinuity of what was going on, even screen directions, you know, were 
nixed him. And I thought, like, either this guy doesn't know what he's doing, or he's so confident that he has the grammar of film down that he's trying to show us a new way to use the material he has to tell the story. There were some films that really changed our perception of what filmmaking was, and certainly it affected what editing was. I mean, I think one of those seminal films is uh, certainly something like Bonnie and Clyde. Some people say I broke those rules first. I certainly did not. I mean, the Russians broke those rules, and, and uh, the Germans broke those rules. This was nothing new, but it was new for, Holly for Hollywood. Several editors have had big impacts on me, have uh, influenced my thinking. Dee Dee Allen certainly is one who has taught me that don't be afraid to take a chance on doing Push something that doesn't seem like it's going to work. When Beatty and Faye Dunaway get to know each other, they're standing on the street corner, and she says, I don't believe you robbed banks. And he said, yes, I do look at my gun. And he pulls it out and holds it to her on the street corner. And that could easily have been done with the tilt down to the gun, the pan over to her hands fidgeting with a Coke bottle, up to her face. But it was done in her eyes look from him down, gun, back to him. It keeps you on edge. There's the excitement, there's the danger, there's the eroticism in not being able to fully get every moment because you're cutting it off and you are not allowing the moment to come to fruition. Bonnie and Clyde was much more violent than anything we'd done because basically the Americans like violence much more than we do. Well, it was shot in so many wonderful ways because this is the scene that Arthur intended to be cut in this fashion. The fact that it was so beautifully executed uh, right from the very first cut. Jerry Greenberg was my assistant, and on the last scene, I left Jerry alone with that scene, and he did all the primary editing on that. All I did was tighten it later. Again, one is not saying that this was the beginning of the American New Wave, because one is sure that there were smaller films before that. But this was the one that, like Birth of a Nation, which suddenly an audience noticed, said, wow. Bonnie and Clyde paved the way for films like Easy Rider. So I had only had one feature under my belt. We started on Easy Rider. I was editing while they were traveling. Footage was flowing in by the mile. It was great, it was exciting, it was totally different than anything I had been involved in. These transitions that everybody remembers going from one scene to the next, where it flashes forward to the scene, flashes back to the scene you're in. Dennis didn't want a straight cut. I didn't want dissolves. So we kept throwing it around, and it was Dennis who, who cooked the part of the idea, which was, what if we went and then came back? And I said, yeah, but let's do it three times. Then we finally arrived at the length, and each one is six frames. I said, ah, now we can use this whenever we want to. Well, as it turned out, it started to become a device. And we so we stopped doing that. I said, no, we aren't going to do that. We only use it in special places. Without giving anything away, everybody was stoned when they were shooting. I learned soon on that I could not be stoned in edit. While it was going on, I thought it was grand. Then I look at it when I was straight, and I say, this is awful, I gotta throw it out and start all over. This film has become an icon. I'm grateful that I had something to do with it because I had grown up in the, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s with movies as they were then. And finally, we're gonna run it for Columbia with Leo Jaffe, chairman of the board. It ended. There was this long pause. Leo finally stands up, and then he says, I don't know what the fuck this picture means but I know we're gonna make a fuck of a lot of money. This kind of cutting in Out of Sight and in movies like JFK represents a further break from Griffith's classic style of seamless editing. Y'all gotta start thinking on a different level like the CIA does. Where editors once labored to preserve the illusion of continuous time and space, they now fracture it at will creating new possibilities for storytelling. Exactly what he said he was, a patsy. Oliver Stone is a very wonderful director for an editor because he 
he lets, he gives the editor free reign. He says to the editor, play jazz. Just go free form. There is a scene in JFK where Oswald walks from a house to a theater, and he said, just when you cut the scene, just make it very chaotic. So I cut the scene in what I thought was a chaotic way, and I showed him the next day, and he said, no, 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 it's, it's got to be way more chaotic than that. Since we cut JFK on a three-quarter inch linear editing system, one thing it had was the ability to hit these buttons and change where the edit went. So I sat there and just banged on the keys like this. And I showed it to him the next day, and he went, that's it. It's in the movie. In Triple X, I did have a new editing philosophy. I had been interested in cubism all my life. And one day, I was watching extreme sports videos. Somebody will do some amazing stunt, and they'll do it in reverse, and then they'll do it forward, and then they'll do it in reverse. I suddenly thought, what if I did it in so many angles that I didn't care whether you saw the beginning of a stunt from four different angles. And the way we would cut it, you would feel that you were going around the event in pieces, so that by the time that motorcycle lands, you actually experience the jump, almost as if you're on the motorcycle, as opposed to standing back in a safe distance, observing the event like you would in real life. This is not real life. This is really relishing this action moment by making a cubist editing approach. Hey.